continue to think about this idea of the blueprint for building, and specifically from Ephesians chapter 4, the reading from Psalm 68 has got something to do with it. We're not sure yet what. So we're going to try to figure that out as we go along. But Ephesians chapter 4, God has a plan for the church. And the idea there in beginning of verse 11 that Jesus is the one who gave some to be apostles and prophets, evangelists, shepherds, teachers. What's the purpose? To equip the saints. That's the church. That's Christians. That's the local family. To equip us for the work of ministry. And what that's going to end up in is the building up of the body of Christ. And then he goes on talking about the unity and the working together and, and, and how all that comes together. And maybe as we think about Ephesians chapter 4, just a little bit of context. We're going to go through this fairly quickly. Uh, but I'd like to see what's going on leading us up to this point of verse 11. Because he does talk about some things that I guess generally we've not really talked about. Uh, sometimes I just read over things, and you know what I do? I just read over it, right? You're just like, well, let's not stop and talk about that because it's a little bit confusing. We don't really know what it's talking about. So maybe we'll try to figure it all out when we think about the book of Ephesians. But the idea is there was gifts, gifts that were given to people. And, we, you know, we're used to that kind of language like in Romans chapter 12 or in 1 Peter chapter 4, uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 12 and 14. Yeah, we're used to the idea of that Jesus came and he gave gifts to people, but Paul also talks about that here in Romans, uh, sorry, in Ephesians chapter 4. So as we think about the book of Ephesians, I just tried to highlight them. How can you highlight what the, the, the chapters are in the book? But if we can kind of just take a, a little bit out of each chapter, it gives us an idea of where he's going, maybe what he's building up to. So Ephesians chapter 1 in verse 20, there, and the whole chapter is really talking about the supremacy of Christ and what he has done, and especially in the resurrection, and now ascended, given the name above all names, and become the king of all kings, uh, the ruler of all. Uh, so we're familiar with the uh, Matthew chapter 28, all authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. So Jesus is the conquering king. <laughs> God raised Christ from the dead and seated him at his right hand in the heavenly places, far above all rule and authority and power and dominion and above every name that is named, not only in this age, but also in the age to come. So this just kind of shows the, the power that Jesus has. It's going to be helpful when we get to Ephesians 4 that we remember that Jesus is all powerful. Continues on, just the next verse. And he has put all things under his feet. This is God the Father, put all things under Jesus' feet, gave him the, as head over all things to the church. So Jesus is overall, but what's to the purpose? The purpose is so that he could lead the church, that he would be the one who is providing the way, and he's the one who's going to be giving us power and strength, promising us, promising us victory, and, and just providing what we need so that we can also live victoriously. Because um, the church is his body, the fullness of him who fills all in all. So this is the design of the church that it would, the church, like this is pretty heavy when you think about it. The church is the fullness of Jesus. Well, I think that's what we're working towards. You know, we're not completely there yet, right? Like we are not, look at us as the church, not individual, but the church, this is the group. This is why the church is so important. It is the bride of Christ. It is uh, the design of Christ that the church would be the fullness of Jesus. Well, that's quite something, isn't it? You know, it, th that's, that's what we're working towards, being the complete fullness of who God has created us to be in his son, Jesus Christ. Well, chapter 2 uh, again, this is talking about where we once were living in sin, separated from God, without hope in the world, and then he has now saved us through his grace and through his love. Ephesians chapter 2, verse 10, for by grace you've been saved through faith. It's not of your own doing. It's the gift of God. It's not a result of works that any of us can boast, but we are his workmanship, God's workmanship. We've been created by him and for him. Created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God's prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. Again, that's probably a verse we've talked quite a bit about over the years. So, but maybe that's a basic 
addition summation of Ephesians chapter 2, and then he goes on talking about that we are the body. And even though we're different, back then the big difference was Jews and Gentiles, but today maybe there's all kinds of differences in our society, but we come together as one because we come from different backgrounds, different ideologies, different upbringings, different education, different gifts, different ways of thinking, different ways of living, right? But we come together as one in the body of Christ to say we are going to be united in him. Now, chapter 3 is just really talking about the, the supreme power of Jesus. And Paul even uh, offers a prayer, praying for God's people that they would be able to understand this power. But maybe, again, a summation now to him who's able to do far more abundantly than all we ask or think according to the power at work within us. To him be the glory in the church and in Christ Jesus throughout all generations forever and ever. Amen. So again, the power of God continuing to work. So the, the interesting thing is then we come upon Ephesians chapter 4, right? And she's, uh, Ephesians chapter 4 seems to shift gears. So it seems like, again, chapters 1 to 3 is more the, the foundation, or we may say it's the theology. It's kind of like the deep thing of God, of who Jesus is. But let's take a minute just to look at Ephesians chapter 4, there beginning in verse 1. And some of these verses may be familiar to us. Verse 1, as a prisoner for the Lord. Could you remember that word, the prisoner? Prisoner of the Lord. Then I urge you to live... Now, again, when he's talking about a prisoner, I don't think he's just talking about that he is serving while he's in jail, but he's saying, I serve the Lord. I'm a bond servant. For the, I've surrendered everything to the Lord. I urge you to live a life worthy of the calling you've received. Be completely humble and gentle. Be patient, bearing with one another in love, and make every effort to keep the unity of the Spirit through the bond of peace. Well, there's one body and one Spirit, just as you were called to the hope when you were called, one Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God and Father of all, who is over all and through all and in all. All right, so this is what God has designed us to be. But the next couple of verses, now if you're like me, and you're probably not like me, but you kind of skip over these ones pretty quick, because we're, we're in a hurry to get to verse 11, right? But look, look what it says in verse 7, because this sounds very familiar, but Maybe we don't study it a lot in Ephesians. But to each one of us, grace has been, been given as Christ apportioned it. That's why it says, when he ascended on high, he led captives in his train and gave gifts to men. What does it mean that he ascended except that he descended to the lower earthly regions? He who descended is the very one who ascended higher than all the heavens in order to fill the whole universe. Well, what that is, it's military language. So if you're a student of the Old Testament, you know that quite often there was physical battles going on between God's people and the pagan nations. Sometimes it was even internal with God's people and God's people. But for the most part, there was... You know, we read about it, we feel a little uncomfortable because there seems to be a lot of fighting and, and blood and people dying. And even through the Psalms, even sometimes David, even wishing harm upon his enemies, not necessarily because he was vindictive or vengeful, but because the pagan nations, the unbelievers, had mocked God and defamed his name and even just tried to destroy God's people, the chosen ones. They were kind of against God's plan. Although we know sometimes God used them for his purposes because the people of Israel were not always faithful as they should have been. So sometimes God even used these nations as a way of disciplining those people that he loved. But that was kind of odd there. It sounds like he's quoting from somewhere. Well, he's quoting from David. 
He's quoting from David Priest. Because David read, read the psalm. It's a psalm of David. So thank you. Psalm 68 that describes this kind of shows us what's going on. This grace was given to us according to the measure of Christ's gift. So there's a gift that God has given, a gift that's been transferred, a, a gift that, that we've received because we're following Christ. What is this gift? What is he talking about? How is this working? And so as we go through the verse, it may help us put it in a little bit of context. So this is the, the verse taken from the Old Testament, Psalm 68. Therefore, it says, when he ascended on high, he led a host of captives and he gave gifts to men. So in Psalm 68, a Psalm of David, it's a picture of God working through him as the king and the military leader and the people of God that would fight the enemy. So back then, you may go out and fight your enemy, and when they were defeated, now some of them would die in battle and others would flee, but then there would be all these things left over, and sometimes there was even people they took as prisoner of war. You know, I mean, don't try to make a big moral judgment at this point. It's like a prison of war, that's an Old Testament. Okay, but that's what they did. That's just the way they lived their life. It was, it was a little more complicated than it is now. But when the king came back, they'd kind of have a parade, right? And so they would come through the city. They'd have a lot of things that they got from the conquest. And there'd even be maybe people that they brought back out of the conquest. And so we call it a victory parade. And so they'd march through the city with the gifts. And so the city, perhaps, back then would have been Jerusalem or Zion. It's the place where God was. So they come back and be honoring God, thanking God, praising God, that now they've had victory over their enemy. Now you think about it in our lives. Well, who's our enemy? So our enemy is not a person. It's not a person in the world. I know there's, there's maybe people that bother you. There's people that tempt you and try you. And there's maybe people that are against you. But they're not the enemy. We know the enemy is more of a spiritual battle. And so sometimes it is Satan. Sometimes he does work through people. But our enemy is the devil. Our enemy is sin. Our enemy, perhaps even we would say, is death. That's the enemy. But Jesus came to give us, give us a victory over the enemy. And so just one more quick look there at the, the verse there in Psalm 68 where David is saying, we're going to come back, we're going to march through the city, and this is what's going to happen. So, again, this was the reading. But see, all the glory goes to God. Psalm 68, verse 17, the chariots of God are twice 10,000. So if you're reading in the Old Testament, sometimes they use the word 10,000. Do you know why they use the word 10,000? Because that's the biggest number they could ever imagine. Like for us, 10,000 is not much. I mean, it sounds crazy, doesn't it? But even if you had $10,000, it's not a lot. It's not going to last you a real long time in this world, right? But that was, that was like us today saying quadrillions, quadrillions. Because that, that's a bigger number we're used to. But, like, you know, people back then, like even the very, very rich people, it's like, well, this guy had like 4,000 sheep. And we're like, well, that's a lot. But I could imagine a farmer had more than that today. But could you imagine being a farmer of 4,000 sheep and you didn't really have fences and you didn't have a lot of hired hands and you didn't, you know. So it's a lot. It's, it's the biggest number. So when it says 10,000, twice 10,000, he's saying the chariots of God, you can't even count them there. See, we're out fighting and we're thinking we're doing it to ourselves, but it's God. So when we're fighting the enemy, we've got to remember it's God, it's not me. It's just not me and my buddies and me and my Christians or even my church family. Yeah, we can help each other, encourage each other, but the power and the victory is found in God. So chariots of God are twice 10,000, thousands upon thousands. The Lord is among them. Sinai is now in the sanctuary. So God, remember Sinai is kind of the picture of 
God gave the law there, but that was also the glory of God, the place of God. You remember when Moses was on the mountain, I mean, there was fire and smoke and all that up in the mountain. And when Moses came down, he shone with the glory of God. But now the glory of God is in the sanctuary. It's in the temple. Perhaps in these days it would have been the tabernacle because the actual temple hadn't been built yet. You, and this is our verse. You ascended on high, leading a host of captives in your train and receiving gifts among men, even the rebellious, that the Lord may dwell there. So this is the idea. This is where it's taken from in the Psalm 68, verse 18. That's what Paul's writing here. It says, he's kind of like, it says that. And this is where it says that. He's quoting this verse. It's kind of interesting because we say that's not exactly what the verse says. Because if you look at Psalm 68, verse 18, it says, gifts were given to the conquering king. Right? People gave him the gifts. But in Ephesians chapter 4, it says Jesus gave the people gifts. Well, which one is it? Well, you know what the answer is. I know you're going, I don't. You got to have both. How can Jesus give something he doesn't have? So he's, Jesus has received gifts, but you know what it's like for us. You know, when, when I receive a gift, I want to keep the gift. I want to use the gift. The gift is about me and about my happiness and my pleasure and, you know, about my glory. I'm, I'm going to keep the, Jesus didn't keep all, I'm going to keep all the gifts for myself. I deserve it. Did Jesus deserve to keep all the gifts? You know he did. What did he do? He said, I've got these gifts. I'm going to give them to you guys. I'm going to share the gifts. So you're telling me that the gifts that Jesus received in the power and the glory of God, he is giving to us? That's exactly what Ephesians 4 is saying. He's given us gifts. And this is the power of God working in us. And so, again, in some translations, the old ones, King James, for instance, he led a host of captivity Captive, the captivity, that, 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 I, I mean, I, you kind of understand maybe why some of the newer translations, you know, put it a little bit simpler to um, host of captives, but captivity captives. So, again, scholars may wonder, what does this mean? Maybe they don't all agree. Captivity captives. Here's one idea. You know, at one time, I was in captivity. I was in captivity to this world. I was in captivity to sin. I was in captivity to trying to live a life that's very self-centered. I was in captivity to really the control of Satan. He had control of my life. I couldn't break free. And I certainly couldn't be forgiven on my own. There's nothing I could do. I was certainly in captivity to death. If I was going to die, I knew I wouldn't be right with God because God's a holy God and I'm anything but holy. I'm not holy. I can't stand before him in innocence or in righteousness. I was in captivity. You know what happens when you're in captivity and there's a war and you lose? You know what happens? You become like the prisoner of war. You become the one who is now in captivity. So the idea is, I at one time was in, in captivity to this world, but you know what Jesus did? He set me free. I'm no longer in, in captivity like I used to be, but now I have, I'm kind of volunteer, voluntarily serving God, following Jesus. I, I don't have to, right? You don't have to. You can make a decision today. But now we serve him and follow him because we love him. Now, the other thing is with the captivity, when I was in captivity, you know what I did with all the blessings I had? It was about me. Right? So I would use my money for me. I would use my time for me. I would use my abilities for me. I would use whatever, you know, influence or power I had, I'd use it for me. Right? For my betterment. So for my happiness. So for my uh, reputation. So I wanted to look good. You know, I wanted to be popular. I wanted to fit in. So it's all about me. I've used everything for me. And when I became a Christian, I surrendered all that. I gave all that to Jesus and said, you know, I'm not going to live that way. I'm going to live for you. I'm surrendering all the stuff that I have. You know, when we become Christians, we literally surrender all of our money. You know, I know when we come here, we talk about 10%. No, it's all his. We surrendered everything to him. 
all my talents and all my gifts, all surrender, even the thing that you're able to do at work or the hobby that you have. You may be pretty good at it, but you're surrendering. God, that's your, that's, I'm giving it to you because, because I'm a prisoner, right? I've surrendered myself. And Jesus says, well, you don't need to live like a prisoner. So this is what I'm going to do. You used to be in captivity to these things. I'm going to give them back to you. So instead of using them for yourself, you can use them for the kingdom. You can use them for God's glory. You can use them in the praise and honor of Jesus. So, and the fact is, so my job, I still have the same job. I still have the same skill set. I still have the same friends. But it's all different now. Because you know what the Bible says? Don't work for your boss like he's the only one that's over you. Work for the Lord. You can, all, you can actually go to work and say, I'm going to forget my boss. I'm just going to work for the Lord. What does working for the Lord look like? Listening to my boss, submitting my, to my boss, loving my boss, trying to help my boss, trying to encourage my boss. I want to see my boss become a Christian. Well, you don't know my boss. Well, Jesus does. He says, I just want, you know, or your hobby or your friends or your, your, your family, just whatever it is. It's like, I've surrendered that to God. He's given it back in holiness. So it's not used according to the world system. It's used according to the kingdom. So this is the idea. Captivity. I would, used to be in captivity to all the stuff I owned. They owned me. I surrendered them to God. He gave them back to me so that I can now use them and I can own them for the glory of God. Right? So I'm not controlled by what used to control me. They're under my power now because Christ is living in me. They don't rule my life. Because you know what people are like in the world. The things of the world rule them. Like, no matter where you look, people are ruled by the world. And you could say, well, I know this person. They're a really good person. They're really nice. What are they ruled by? They're ruled by performance. They're ruled by, I'm just going to be a nice person. Why do you want to be a nice person? Because I want people to think I'm a nice person. Oh, so it's really about you, is that it? Yeah, pretty much, right? As opposed to saying, no, it's not about me at all. It's not about what I can do to be noticed or to be seen or to be appreciated or to be thanked or people just to think I'm good. Because I'm not good. Only in God am I good. He has made me good. He has made me into the person that he's created me to be from the very beginning. So Satan's come along, just like the enemies of the Old Testament. He's ruined everything. And Jesus came so that he'd set us free. And that we could continue to live in this world, not for ourselves, but for him. This is the idea of he ascended on high. Jesus was ascended. And now it goes into the details of saying, well, if he ascended, that also means that he ascended. In other words, Jesus did come down from heaven. Now he's gone back to where he was before he came to the world. So Jesus is God, came from heaven, lived in the world. Now he's gone back to heaven. And I mean, would anybody fault Jesus for saying, well, look at all I've done. It's all about me. But he's saying, no, I want you to be a part of my plan. I want you to be a part of the kingdom. I want you to be a part of my future. I want you to be a part of a home in heaven. I want you to be there. So he's, he's actually serving and working, right? I mean, sometimes we, we get the idea when Jesus ascended to heaven, he's sitting at the right hand of God, and what he's doing is he's just resting. I don't know if you've tried to be a mediator or an intercessor when people are having problems. That's work. You know what Jesus does right now? He intercedes for the Father on behalf of everyone who calls out to him that's a child of God. That's a lot of work. He's working hard for us. He's watching over us. He protects us. He's blessing us. Jesus is working for us, for God's glory. Does that make sense? So this is the idea that he's giving us gifts. So now what? What do we do with the gifts? So 1 Peter chapter 4 uses the same kind of language as each has received a gift. Where do we receive it from? We received it from Jesus because he's conquered everything. He now owns everything. He's plundered everything. And what's he doing with his everything? He's giving us gifts. So we've received a gift. Use it to serve one another as stewards of God's very great, varied grace. 
Whoever speaks is one who speaks the oracles of God. Whoever serves is the one who serves by the strength that God provides. So these are the gifts that he's given to us because he's the conquering king and he wants to bless our lives. In 2 Timothy chapter 1, a very similar type of thing. For this reason, I remind you, fan into flame the gift of God. There it is again, the gift. So Timothy has at least one gift. Maybe he's got several gifts, but he's got the gift of God. Maybe the gift of God is preaching. Maybe the gift of God is leading the, the local church. But the gift of God, which is in you through the laying on of my hands. For God gave us a spirit not of fear, but of power and love and self-control. So again, there's a gift that he has, but he's got to use it with these three qualities. With the spirit of power, the spirit of love, right? You don't want somebody with too much power with no love, and yet you don't want somebody with love and no power. But you also have to have self-control. So those three things are very important when we think about how we're going to use the gift that God's given us. We're going to sing a song, Jesus Paid It All. All to him I owe. Sin had left a crimson stain, but he washed it white as snow. He's come to redeem us. And redeeming us not only means making us ready for heaven, but redeeming us also means making us ready to live in the world. A, a new person, a different person, a new way of thinking, a new way of speaking, a new way of feeling, new way of living. See, everything has changed through the power of Jesus Christ. That's why he came, to change us, to be like God. Oh, it's a long process. We know that. It didn't all happen overnight. And we still continue to work to be conformed into the image of Christ. If we can encourage you today, you know, maybe, maybe you're not a Christian. Maybe you've never if we could use the terms we've talked about today, surrender to God to say, I've been living for myself. I've been living in a worldly way. I've been living in a sinful way. I've been living in a selfish way. And I want to surrender my life. I want to give him everything. He's going to take control. I'm going to follow him. I'm going to serve him. I'm going to love him. I'm going to commit to him. Because he's loved me so much. I want to love him. It's not just about the fear of going to hell, although that should be a fear. But it's, man, he's loved me so much. Love changes people. If today you're ready to surrender, to make Jesus the Lord of your life, to, see, repenting of sins, all that surrender, isn't it? Repenting of sins, saying, I know I've done wrong. I don't, don't want to do that anymore because I want to please Jesus Christ. I want to follow him calling on the name of the Lord, and then being baptized. See, again, what's baptism? It's symbolic. It's a picture of dying to self, being buried in water, being raised to live a new life. And when you're baptized, that's the, the point. When you actually unite with Christ in his death, my death, his burial in my burial in the water, and his resurrection, I want to be raised to live a new life. Today, you want to be baptized into Christ so your sins can be forgiven and you'll receive the gift of the Holy Spirit, which gives us the power to live the way God wants us to. If we can encourage you in your walk with Christ, let's stand. We'll sing this song. Can lead us.